Hello everyone, so during this video today we'll be making a Godzilla, you could say. So now that we have a scientifically accurate blue out of the way, it's time to make Godzilla's skeleton, I say, and learn some fun facts about this monster along the way. So hopefully you enjoyed this video today. On this kaiju size project today, we'll be using aluminum wire, I say, to make the base frame today, as well as some oven baked clay to make the bones to help everything just kind of well stay, as well as some tin foil, you might say, to keep the weight down because, well, that might be a big problem for this massive clay doll, I say. But given Gojira's upright posture, you might say, this doll ended up actually being fairly well balanced out, I say. At least in comparison to some of my other theropod projects, one might say, because yeah, that's usually a big problem. I hate how they weigh so much at the front, and very little at the back. But let's not get too sidetracked today by theropod posture, I say. Because as I sculpt away on this Gojira-sized project today, we'll be learning some fun facts about this monster, you could say. Godzilla has been around for a long, long time, and here are some interesting facts about the King of the Monsters you might not know about. Now, first off, Gojira, did you say Gorilla Whale? Even if you're not a fan of the movies or the monster himself, pretty much everyone knows what you mean when you utter the words Godzilla. But do you know what the name really means? Well, Godzilla is the name that became synonymous with the monster, but his original name, in the name of the good people of Japan, call him Gojira. And with the word Gojira, we get a rather funny play on words. In the Japanese language, Gojira is a combination of two words when put together mean an entirely different thing. But this is not a grammar lesson. Gojira actually means Gorilla Whale, a description quite fitting especially during his earlier years. Now let's talk about his journey to the Hollywood Walk of Fame. When it comes to Hollywood, celebrities are center stage. One of the most popular attractions there is the Hollywood Walk of Fame. Back in 2004, for his 50th birthday, the G-Man was finally given a star, and his rightful place in cinema history. But did you know Godzilla is one of the very few fictional characters to ever be awarded his own star? Out of 2,500 stars, the G-Man is one of 18 awarded to a make-believe character. Quite the achievement for a guy in a suit. Which leads us to our next topic, Suitmation. When the creators of the very first Godzilla movie were trying to figure out how they could put the film together, they researched multiple sorts of different ways they could bring the atomic reptile to life. At first they wanted to make the beast come to life using stop motion. The same technique Godzilla's rival, King Kong, had in his first movie nearly 20 years prior. In the end, the crew came to the realization that stop motion in the fashion of King Kong was, well, too expensive and difficult for this small Japanese studio. This led to the decision to create elaborate suits that an actor could wear and the rest is beautiful cinema history. Now with all that said, I must admit I am actually quite excited to actually bring Godzilla to life in the future using the art of stop motion because well obviously that was his intended purpose and I feel kind of honored that I'll be able to well, get to do that with this 1954 Godzilla character. And personally, given his character design of rather large stompy feet and using his tail as support, he is honestly probably a very well balanced out stop motion character and it's kind of a shame that they honestly weren't able to actually do that. But Godzilla wasn't always going to be, well, a giant reptile, and we'll talk about that later on. But speaking of giant reptiles, we're now going to move on to a subject that I'm quite familiar with, dinosaurs. In this case, we're talking about a Franken-dino. Now, it's a little obvious that Godzilla's look was inspired by dinosaurs, but do you know which ones exactly? The first few dinosaur influences are really easy to predict. Go ahead, pause, take a few guesses. I bet you won't get the third one. The T-Rex is the main influence due to the beast walking on two legs, and having an upright stance according to science at that time. This was perfect for the suit mation, as a human needed to be put inside the suit and be able to perform. Not to mention this was also perfect for stop motion. Plus, it's the damn Tyrannosaurus Rex, the most popular dinosaur ever found. The second influence is the Stegosaurus. And you guessed it, this is the inspiration for the G-Man's iconic dorsal plates. Now, with that being said, I am slightly disappointed he doesn't have any thegomizers on the end of his tail, and yes, fun fact, that is what these spikes are called on the end of the Stegosaurus's tail, a thegomizer. 
And lastly, the most hard to recognize is an Iguanodon. And that was used to inspire the design of Godzilla's arms. Now with that being said, uh, where's the thumb spike? Because well, act dumb, get the thumb. Why not, <laughs> like really? There's many weapon opportunities that they kind of missed here as far as I'm concerned and personally has inspired me to perhaps make a unedited version of Godzilla someday. Either way, even with the missed opportunities aside, it is still some pretty cool stuff. Now, let's talk sound. Because when it comes to Godzilla, I think it's safe to say he has among the most iconic roars in film history. So when it comes to creating among the most iconic sounds in film history, it had to have been done using million dollar equipment and a huge team, right? How's about more like a couple of guys, an old double bass instrument, and a leather glove? The roar of Godzilla was created by sliding a leather glove down the loosened strings of a double bass. Now, personally, I didn't know this at the beginning, and I found this fact quite interesting, but at the same time, not all that surprising, because, well, you would be surprised on how many iconic movie sounds are created using very simple techniques, such as a wet rag, or even just using some, well, celery to sound like breaking bones. Now, haters are gonna hate. Now, this is a controversial subject for the fans of Godzilla, but more or less, it's worth talking about and being civil. You might not appreciate 1998 Godzilla, but the movie, as far as Godzilla films goes, brought in the most money in the box office when you take inflation into account. This doesn't mean the movie made the most profit, but in its theatrical run, more people went to see it than any other Godzilla movie. Even more than Godzilla 2014. Back in 1998, Godzilla pulled in $376 million worldwide. Now, adjusting for inflation, that roughly translates to $600 million EST. Godzilla 2014, the second best box office run for a Godzilla movie, comes to $580 million, about $20 to $30 million less. Even when you take the seven years of inflation into account after that film's release. Either way, I think it's safe to say these are kaiju-sized numbers. Hate it or love it, Godzilla 1998, the movie, was seen by many eyes and created tons of new fans for the character. So this controversial topic brings us to, well, our next topic. Everyone loves a critic, right? So back in the day before YouTube critics, people had to actually take their movie-going advice from so-called professional movie watchers. Oh, damn, that sounds like a job I want. The most famous of these were, of course, Siskel and Ebert. The two had created a popular television show and had become the world's leading movie critics. If you wanted to know how good or bad a movie was going to be, back then you likely listened to these guys. But not everyone was a fan of their sometimes harsh critiques. But especially Emdrecht, the director from Godzilla 1998. He had gone through a couple of harsh reviews by these two. And, well, I think it's safe to say it kind of aggravated the hell out of him. So, for Godzilla 1998, he added a couple characters who were mockeries of the movie reviewers. Mayor Ebert and his butt-kicking assistant, Gene. Literally giving these obnoxious and annoying characters the names of his enemies. Gene is Siskel's first name and Mayor Ebert literally has the same last name as Roger T. Ebert. Even the characters look damn near the same as their real-life counterparts. It's honestly quite funny. And personally, I get quite a kick out of knowing this because even I'm guilty as charged of doing some of that in my earlier animations to people that I particularly didn't like. So, yeah, quite funny. And, yeah, I guess you could say great minds think alike. So my hat goes off to you, good sir, because, yeah, well, you mess with the... <laughs> people that are creative, you will probably be immortalized in ways you probably aren't going to be a fan of. Now, speaking of things people probably aren't a fan of, well, Godzilla wasn't almost a giant reptile. He was almost godzilla -pus. Godzilla was almost a lot different looking. Like, completely different looking. Before we had the iconic design of the monster, before the movie was even made, and before it was even green-lighted into production, Tomi Yuku Tanaka, one of the original creature designers of the monster, wanted his beast to be a giant octopus. Yeah, Godzilla was almost godzilla -pus. An octopus design was discussed as a tribute to the classic tales of the Kraken that would attack sailors. But luckily, this idea was scrapped in order to better fit their monster for a human actor to play the creature inside a suit. Thus, Godzilla was born. Now, 
he can talk? Godzilla roars, groans, barks, and growls. But did you know Godzilla talked once before? Back in the movie Godzilla vs. Gigan. Godzilla and his best bud, Anguirus, actually had a conversation. When they pick up a disturbing signal from alien invaders. In the original Japanese version, speech bubbles were used to show the communication between the two monsters. But once the Americans got their hands on it, things got super weird. I like the idea of monsters communicating, but personally it was not very well done. I will provide a link in the description for those of you who want to see this, well, rather strange adaptation of these monsters talking. It's weird. And now for our last fun fact about Godzilla today. Did you know Godzilla is part of Marvel history? You know about Godzilla and you know about Marvel. But it's a lesser known fact that Godzilla was once part of this universe. Back in the late 1970s, Godzilla had a massive 24 issue run in a comic series in the Marvel Universe. For two years, Godzilla fought alongside the Avengers and other sorts of Marvel characters. After an epic battle with Thor, where the two were practically at a stalemate, Godzilla was eventually chased back out to sea and his time at Marvel was done. Maybe now that Godzilla vs. Kong is finally out of the way, maybe we can get that adaptation of Godzilla vs. Marvel. One can only dream, right? Now, honestly, I must admit, I'm personally not really a big fan of superhero movies, mainly because I kind of find them all to be the same. So, I would admit if there was a Godzilla in one, that would probably drastically change my mind and opinion on them. Mainly because I just want to see these superheroes get their butts handed to them by this giant atomic reptile because, let's be honest, I don't really think many in the Marvel Universe have anything that could withstand a, well, creature that is a representation of the atomic bombs that went in, well, Japan. So, yeah. Go Godzilla, go! And personally, because I'm not necessarily a big fan of superhero movies in particular, and say the Marvel Universe as well, I'm gonna take one more shot at it because I'm doing some fun facts on this video. The Kool-Aid Man is part of that universe. I mean, oh yeah! I mean, seriously, look it up. The Kool-Aid Man is actually part of the Marvel Universe. And I will not take that, well, franchise seriously up until the Kool-Aid Man is in it. Aside from that one bonus fun fact about the Kool-Aid Man being part of the Marvel Universe, that concludes 10 fun facts about Godzilla. So I hope you enjoyed this video, and if you did, you can let me know by smashing the like button below, and perhaps leaving a comment what you think of the project, as well as subscribing if you're new to this series, because next time we'll be doing a deeper dive on the 1954 Godzilla. And now it's time for the build rundown. So on this kaiju size project today, it's safe to say we got about 90% of the skeleton out of the way. Sadly, to my dismay, there's definitely some more plate construction on the way. Yay. One might say that I'm kinda missing feathers today. And I'm sad to say that those things did set me back some time, I say, so unfortunately that's why there's been some delays for this video, I say. Because of plates. Oh, there's so many plates. The materials used today for this kaiju project, I say, are armature wire, one might say, as well as some plasticine clay to make everything stay, and oven baked clay to make the bones and all those plates today. And the tools used today to make this Godzilla skeleton, I say, are sculpting knives, one could say, because those are handy to have at your dismay, as well as a rake, one could say, because those are handy to clean the dirty clay away. And some rubber sculpting tools, because we are not fools. In all honesty, yeah, silicone sculpting tools, this isn't very poetic, but yeah, they are great, uh, very good at getting your hard to reach places, so if you don't have a set of those, I would highly recommend getting some. And that concludes this project for today, during part 2 next time, I say, we'll be adding the plasticine clay, as well as getting the skeleton out of the way. As well as we'll do a bit of painting, I say, before the plasticine clay, because that's just too difficult to get at once all of the sculpting is underway. And we'll be learning some fun facts along the way about 1954 Godzilla, I say. And quick shout out to Dragon Claw for spotting Milton the Moose in the last how-to video. Anyway, I appreciate you sticking to the very end of this video. Be sure to leave a like if you enjoyed the content, comment below what you think, share with your friends, and perhaps consider subscribing if you're new, because, well, I was in the closet for seven hours talking about Godzilla today. There's a lot of work that goes into this stuff.